if I give my real age, they'll know, they'll be able to back up and figure out when I met you, and I should have not have met you in the place I met you. So, <laughs> I shouldn't have Wow. There. <laughs> There's no context there. Right. I'm going to jail. <laughs> I was definitely an adult, but I was definitely not of legal age to be in I was car. 17 and 99 one hundred. <laughs> oh, that's awkward. Everybody, I'm here today with Autumn Pippenberg, and um, oh, that sounds really cool to say over the mic. Um, <laughs> she's been a friend of mine, I don't know, for 12, 13, 14, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of years. Lot of years. Um, and uh, I want to have her on today to talk about her Art of Giving Foundation, which is incredible. And uh, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are most welcome. It is a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. I, uh, you still look the same. Uh, so do you. <laughs> I, I think we're aging pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Should we give our real ages or just pretend that we're younger than we are? If I give my real age, they'll know, they'll be able to back up and figure out when I met you and I should have not have met you in the place I met you. So <laughs> I shouldn't have Wow. There. <laughs> There's no context there. Right. I'm going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely an adult, but I was definitely not of legal age to be in I was car. 17 and 99 one hundred. <laughs> Oh, that's awkward. Um, as, yeah, it's funny you say that. So I, um, we played the show on Saturday, and a, and a friend of, of the band took a picture, or, or what, whatever they're called, so old guy, you see, boomerang. Or oh, yeah. Thing, right? and it, I'm having some back issues again. So I um, was lying on the stage, and I was trying to not really be seen because people were higher than me, right? So I thought if I get down here, nobody will really see me part of the front row. Yeah. And I was stretching my back, you know, in Sphinx and going yeah. into, like, whatever that's called child pose or whatever and doing that a little bit before I had to get up and sing again yeah. and she took the video from up high and did a boomerang of it right and she just wrote tell me you're old without telling me you're old <laughs> I was like fuck like and it, all I could do was forward it like right, share it and say she has a point yeah like it was really funny I had to laugh at myself in that but um anyway so yeah I want to have you on today because I wanted to do not just like things that I don't like about America. I want to do things that I do like about America, people that I've met, that I admire, um, that are doing wonderful things, um, whether no matter what area it's in, but it seems like you kind of cover some of the, some, many of the boxes for me in the sense of it's creative, it's artistic, and it's philanthropic, and it's um, giving, and it's help giving back to the community. All the things that these, you know, right wingers that I don't like are supposed to supposedly be for, mm -hmm. but and I never see it, you know? So I, I just wanted to have you on today as a, as a sort of a, one of the rare positives that we're going to have in this, uh, on this podcast. So, um, <laughs> thank you for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you yeah. can be as mean as you like to anybody <laughs> you like, to say. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to try and keep it positive. Okay. So, um, okay. So first of all, uh, we have, so I have this up here and I know, I was curious because I hadn't actually explored this very much until I ha had gone on a note and invited you on. And I didn't realize you had sort of diversified this into so many different areas. So sure. it looks like you've got it, the art of giving. I'll let you explain it in a nutshell, but you've got it split into three sort of ideas here. You've mm -hmm. got the artist mural program, the CPS supply drive and the artist revolution, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize you'd split it up into these things. So tell me. Whatever you want to tell me about it in a nutshell to start, sure. and we'll go from there. Yeah, um, well, the name itself, Art of Giving, has a lot of connotations to it, and there's lots of creative ways to give back. Uh, so no right or wrong you know, answer there, but I chose art as a means to give back and to be philanthropic and as a, as a, a new means and a creative means of communicating with our youth and with our, communi our communities, so... We found over the last four years since we've um, been initiated that there's a few areas that really uh, needed our support, uh, one of which are the actual Chicago artists themselves. Um, yep. We work with all types of artists, from musicians to sculptures to visual artists to all, all across the board, but we do tend to work 
primarily with uh, visual artists, so painters, and we were working with them to um, get them work in the beginning and get them paid for their work. And then we started to realize that there's not a lot of um, funding out there for that. So we started combining it with some of the work that we were doing in the schools. So um, uh, the artist mural program actually is intertwined with our uh, restoration work that we do in CPS. Uh, so we go into Chicago Public Schools um, and we find the schools in the most underserved neighborhoods that need restoration work and we do the work. So it might be, you know, restoring a drop ceiling in the cafeteria that's falling mm -hmm. apart. It might be ripping out old heaters that are all rusty and, you know, dangerous for the children to be walking past. It might be just replacing a wall that's been crumbling for a while. Um bathroom stalls, things like that. But we always go in and we replace it, not just restore it, but we replace it with a mural. So right. we're bringing art into the schools and inspiring them and showing them that giving back can be fun and energetic and and just inspire and ignite change. So we started combining our artist mural program with the uh, restoration projects by bringing the artists in to help with the actual murals. And some of these do get funded and some of them are just strictly um, private donors and volunteers that are, are helping out. So it's kind of across the board. Then, um, being that we're working in CPS all the time, we became very close with a lot of the teachers and principals, and there are a lot of organizations out there that raise money um, for, like, backpack drives for the kids. Hmm. And I overheard... To, to buy them their own new backpacks? Or yeah, their like own backpacks make sure and school they're filled supplies. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, which is an awesome thing to do. The kids definitely need that. But I I overheard some teachers on their lunch break kind of like joking. But, you know, yeah, once they get their backpacks, we never see those supplies. Like they don't bring them back to school and, and utilize them. So that's great mm -hmm. and all. But we need something that we can monetize and we can track because otherwise it's kind of a waste. So started talking with all the teachers and realizing that it was probably better just to do a fundraiser for them. A drive, a supply drive for them. Yeah. And so that's what our CPS supply drive is. We do um, classroom supplies. So it's art and educational supplies, but it's also teacher needed supplies like staplers and highlighters and rubber bands and yeah. paper clips. Things which, that which I'm shocked at how much as a, as a parent and I myself and that the that they we continually are asked for in various ways by teachers, yeah. even in a reasonably affluent neighborhood where they've got plenty of money there's still always that kind of we could never say no to more stuff right i'm like really is it that's well i mean that's partly why i want to do this podcast in the first place is the fact that i think you know government funds are vastly um uh misappropriated you know uh -huh. like you'd think schooling would be like top of the list because <laughs> right. The, the, the health and education health should be right, right, yeah right up there and yeah. by the way speaking of kids if there is going to be some background noise on this <laughs> podcast because our kids are playing upstairs together and it sounds like, I don't know, a fucking hurricane upstairs <laughs> right now. So, okay, so you do um, drives to try and get the kids backpacks of their own, but you're, it's more important that the, the, the teachers get to hold on to the stuff that they need. Yeah, we, we actually don't do backpack drives. Um, other organizations out there do the backpack drives. We do supply drives, and we are collecting everything from folders and binders. And I mean, we do collect markers, crayons, color pencils, all the things that they keep within the classroom, but um, we're not distributing those to the parents or the, or the kids. We're distributing them to the teachers themselves. Right. Um, now, I had the pleasure of going to one of your um, big galas uh, yeah. a little while ago now. Um, obviously, with my schedule as a musician, it doesn't often coincide. And, and you invite me to every one, and I've made it to one. <laughs> and I and it was fantastic. I just thought you did such an amazing job. And um, I was blown away by the local artists and the stuff that they were doing. And they were all so vastly different, of course, too. There was... I mean, the variety was incredible, and every one of them were still incredibly talented. Um, I guess as a as a musician coming up and trying to make a living, obviously I've worked really hard to to be, make a good living. But I know what it's like in a creative zone. Uh, how how have you? What have you heard from them 
back feedback from you as far as what your help has meant to them or done for them because that that's very close to my heart in that sense yeah um i think a lot of the events in chicago and especially the charity galas they kind of use artists galas just funny <laughs> just and yeah, I forget I forget which country I'm in. You know, I find myself saying it both ways. I don't even know. <laughs> galas, galas, whatever. Um, but yeah, I I find that they use artists just to kind of have like icing on the cake to their event. You know, this splatter, uh, the sprinkles of artwork kind of mm-hmm. throughout the event, and I think that that's humiliating. You know, we're not there to, you know, <laughs> bedazzle your event. Uh, so our galas, galas are, you know, the artwork is the cake, really. Like, you're going to see, you know, 12 to 16 different artists in Chicago, um, all curated because we feel that not only are they good artists and talented and they're up and coming, but they have good morals and ethics and integrity. They're also giving back. They're volunteering and helping with our projects. Um, and so it's just a nice little circle you know, of, of giving back and taking care of our community. So yeah, um, when, you know, when it, when gala time comes, we get a lot of submissions for artists because they know they're going to sell a lot of work at, at the gala and we can only fit so many because the venue is only so big. And until mm-hmm. we outgrow that venue kind of, you know, stuck with 12 to 16 artists, but, um, there's kind of a, a fight to, to get into the gala because they... That's, that's a great thing. I yeah, mean, they do sell a lot of work, which is, you know, it's great for them. So I, I myself sell work at the gala, yeah. and uh, I know which how, we'll how get beneficial into. it is. We'll talk so. about that, too. Yeah, yeah. It, um, you were just discussing some of the criteria of how you pick the artists. Is there anything else that goes into that, of how you actually pick? Because if, if you've got this small little amount that you can handle for one of these big galas at, like, 12, 16 people Mm -hmm. there obviously must be a hell of a lot of people wanting to be part of that how do how do you decide yeah um i like to work with artists that are not represented yet don't have a a manager or booking agent um i i do that because i don't want a portion of the commission from the sale that day going to the art of giving foundation and then also going to their manager and then they're left with very little you know Mm -hmm. Um, and also because they are up and coming and they need some marketing and exposure and support. So I'd rather give that opportunity to somebody who hasn't been really discovered yet to be discovered. And also, too, they have to live in Chicago. They have to be a native Chicago artist. They do not, you know, have to have a degree in art. They um, can have just started, you know, but they do have to have at least three to five pieces to showcase at the gala. So. Um, j- just a, a local funny thing, but when you say Chicago, what do you mean? Because if I say I'm from Chicago, I get punched in the face because yeah. I'm from I live in Plainfield. Yeah, that's not Chicago. <laughs> that's, so are you counting? You have to be in Cook County, Chicago. Okay, Cook yeah. County. Okay, and if okay. you have kids, they have to go to a Chicago public school. Okay. <laughs> See, that, that's what I mean. Because yeah. for people that are going to be listening to this from across, around the world, people that know me from other places... They wouldn't know that, of course. There's that right. kind of joke that yeah. you're not really, you know, I say I'm from Chicago because anybody else in the rest of the world knows roughly where that is. Right. And to me, Chicago's kind of like a 60-mile circle. I know it's not, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. but anybody who's living down in the city considers it just to be that little bit. And I'm like, that's fine. But, you know, for me, it's just the big city mm-hmm. and around it and the same for any big city. So I'm just curious as an actual line when it comes mm-hmm. to your foundation. So it's actually Cook County, yeah. the city official, yeah. not the city in general. And we do it that way too because when you're applying for grants, you have to be very specific as to you know who you're serving, what demographics you're serving, and also the grants you're applying for could be specific to a region. So if we're, say, applying for you know, a grant to help with some of our Chicago public school mural installations, well, the grant's probably coming from the city of Chicago, which means ah. we have to install the mural in Chicago, and we probably have to use Chicago artists. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 a also a technical business thing, too, that you've got to deal with. Yeah. Um, so I, on a side note, um, you did mention that you do art, and I am a huge fan of your personal art. And I don't know how that got started in your style, if you just you know, tried to draw yourself someday or something and realized you were pretty good at drawing the female form. 
but I mean, they're, oh they're absolutely freaking fantastic. Like, yeah. uh, like if I had that, you know, if I had money to spend on that much, I would do that myself because I, I love it. And at some point I will when I'm able to, because I think <laughs> your art's fantastic. But um, tell me how you got started doing that. And was it that that gave you the idea for the foundation or vice versa? Or like, how did your love of pers- your personal love of art Come, yeah. all this kind of all mesh together and yeah. connect everything I mean just like everybody there's a huge long story behind it but I wanted to go to art school um after high school I really wanted to go to art school art pretty much got me through school got me through life it was my meditation my escape and uh, I was still sure never going to make any money in art so I went to dental school I went for seven years until I mean I got into clinicals everything it was like I don't like this. I, this is not for me. This is not creative. I don't want to work in an office. I I can't even talk to people. Um, it's just lonely, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I found that it wasn't because I couldn't interact with people that I was lonely. It was because, I, well, I had, I couldn't be creative. It's too cut, you know, too cut and dry. So, I dropped out of college and changed my degree and went to a new school for behavioral neuroscience and got really involved in psychology. I'm still taking classes in this, switching my degree so many years later. I think I have like a year and a half left to finish, but um, with the focus in art therapy. And uh, at the time of switching and everything, I had no inclination that I'd be running a non-for-profit that had to do with art. I was running a production company and a staffing agency and doing other things in the creative world. But um, I got an itch to join a charity. So I started looking around and volunteering. And there's a charity that uh, worked with children. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but I absolutely fell in love with the kids and fell in love with communicating with them because we spoke a different language through art. And I just realized there's definitely something there. So that's kind of what, you know, drove me to switch the career, get into, you know, the therapy side of things. And Do you, do you want to talk about that? I know you traveled to be, is that something you could mention on this? Yeah. It's fine. There's not any. Yeah, I just, I won't bring up names. No, but but, mm-hmm. but I know that you traveled to. I went to Nicaragua, Nicaragua and yeah. Haiti and yeah, I uh, worked with some orphanages and, and the kids there and continued to go back for, you know, over the course of eight years and watch the kids grow up and went a few times a year and brought them clothes and shoes and soccer balls, but lots of art supplies mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, very, uh, very inspiring to see the kids go from uh, having no self-esteem or self-worth to being really positive and um, just excited about life and living again, like every child should be, mm-hmm. um, all because someone cared and took the time to find another route to communicate with them, you know. And I think that that's why I also do art myself is because I'm able to communicate with myself internally. It's my world is I, I'm filled with a lot of thoughts and noises. My head never shuts off. It's very blah, 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 like all, all day. I don't know if some of you guys can relate, but like I'm just like shut up sometimes. And as soon as I start painting, it's, mm-hmm. it's just silent. So and I don't even notice. Uh, should I cut in uh, three seconds of silence yeah. for effect? Yeah. Yeah. Just, or, or, a, or a tumbleweed? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> just going past the screen. I'm totally putting that in. I'm going to yeah. find some video of a tumbleweed going by and dead silence. Or just, a, yeah. just go past. I think any creative person can definitely, in some way, it's a version of what you just said of it. it's clearing your mind in some way. Yeah. It's like you need it. It's almost like you, you couldn't imagine life without it. Yeah. I don't know how I ever didn't have it. I think that's why I was lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I don't know if you can relate to this as, as a musician or a creative, but it doesn't it kind of seem like what you find your best work not as popular to everyone else, but like what you think is like shit. People love it. They like eat it up. Like it's with the same with my popular songs or my progressive songs. It's always the same. Yeah. One still gives me 
it still gives me joy to perform, but it's more for other people. Mm -hmm. And Siberium is purely for me. People can like it or they can fuck right off. I don't care. (laughs) But it seems like people are, are resonating with it. And I think that's because of how much I love it if that and makes don't sense. care that they do or not yes yeah. and that's hopefully what i'm doing with this too is i'm just gonna i'm being myself it's no bullshit right it, it's the way i talk it's the way i interact <laughs> it's just completely me and 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 i'm going to talk about the things i care about and if people don't like it that's fine but there are going to be people who who do yeah. s- see feel that way in the world or need to feel that Maybe, oh, it's nice to hear that I didn't realize I thought I was the only one that feels that way or mm-hmm. whatever. Which feels like an increasing thing in this country where, you know, like, it's it's almost as if people feel like hope is gone. And well, like, we're very divided. In other countries, everyone's on the same path. Or at least country, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> right. We are very, The extremes very are divided. here. And for the audio listeners, my hands are pretty close. <laughs> and then <laughs> And then there's... America's like here. It's just like, uh, it's, you know, I've, I've, it's funny that we talked at the start about getting older, but I, as I get older, I care less about pleasing everyone. I don't need everyone to like me. I just, yeah. I just, if people agree, uh, you know, like me for who I really am, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. I just, yeah, I, I, that went out the door for me a long time ago. Um, Probably yeah. <laughs> sometime for, as a child, I realized I don't care. Uh, but I do want people to know who I am before they make that decision. You know, I, it really bothers me when people automatically assume they don't like me when they don't know me yet. So, yeah. Because I think. Oh. So tell me where people can go to, like, check out your own art and buy it or yeah. check it out or recommend it to other people. So. Uh, my company is called Pipco Inc. That's uh, where the checks come. <laughs> so it's pipcoinc.com. And we'll put links, by the way, guys, yeah. to all this stuff. Uh, you know, the website for Art of Giving and All Autumns. Anything we've mentioned so far, we'll be putting links. Great. Yeah. Is that site going to have not only your art, but it's going to, I'm assuming, have links to... The, the foundation and, and what else? Yeah, it'll definitely, um, or it definitely has a link to the Art of Giving Foundation in my bio. Um, so you can see um, all the work that I've sold or, or currently working on in progress or uh, work that's for sale. You can commission me to do something specific for you um, as long as it's within my style and my range. Mm-hmm. And then um, also I am an art therapist, so you could book me through the site as well. If you're looking for art therapy for either yourself or your child or your group. or Okay, I definitely need to know more about that. Sure. Sure. Art therapy, go. Because <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I have no idea exactly what you mean by that. So, well, there's all different kinds of therapy, right? Um, and this is just uh, another form of therapy, and it's used in conjunction with traditional methods as a form of um, meditative or meditation, relaxation, and really just tapping into your subconscious. So... Essentially, what we're doing is we're communicating with the subconscious and figuring out what's bothering the individual through another communication form, which is art. So some sometimes you can't say what's wrong. You know, if it's a child, for instance, who, you know, perhaps is being abused at home and they can't physically say what's happening, um, maybe because they don't really know that it's wrong. They just feel wrong. Right. They know yeah, they sure. feel they feel off. So they can't communicate it verbally, but when you get them, you know, in front of a piece of paper um, or with some clay or or whatever the medium is that you're using, more times than not, it will come out that there's something wrong or some something bothering them, and and that opens up a dialogue for the therapist then to start asking more specific questions. Uh, how so, does that work, though? In the sense of, are they coming to you? Is that going through some kind of health insurance or? Or, like, is that just a, a private client reaching out to you for that? Yeah, it's, um, so we work with other foundations that um, have group homes or what we call SIB groups, which are siblings that live in the same home together that are being fostered. Right. Um, or foster children. We're working with churches and community centers. But then oftentimes, too, I just might get a call from, you know, 
somebody in Naperville, a mom, you know, it's like my daughter is really struggling with going through puberty and I don't know how to talk to her. Something's wrong. And we've tried all different types of therapy and her psychologist suggested uh, we try art therapy. So, um, yeah. And, and how many times have you seen it? I know this is probably a bad example, but how many times have you seen it in movies where the child or the person explains their issue in the movie through the art? Through art. They, in whatever way, it's the, it's how they're trying to yeah. show what it is that's wrong. They can't they can't speak or they can, but they're traumatized, whatever it may be, and they right. the, it it gives them that way of explaining it without actually having to say the words per right. se. Um, it's funny because I I have this urge as I get older now to I've always wanted to go into like uh, I so I should back up. When I was in the boy band back in the day, yes, I was, sorry. Um, I visited, um, was it St. Jude's or in London, uh, the famous London cancer, children's cancer patient ward. Uh, okay. St. Jude's is a big one here. I don't know Saint, if it's the same. It's, in it's either St. Jude's or, I'm just, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, but it's, it's famous anyway. It's, you know, the, the one that everybody knows from London. I'm just, I thought it was St. Jude's though. But anyway, uh, the point is we went through and it was a, you know, it was a pretty life-changing experience for me just to, to witness that. Mm-hmm. Also a big part of what made me an atheist actually was seeing kids with cancer yeah. and realizing that no, no loving being could ever let that happen on purpose if they could stop it. Like all of us right now would go... And right. stop it if we could, right. right? If we had the knowledge to cure I don't cancer, think any of us would have created it in our bodies to begin with. In the first place, in the first place, right? Not only yeah. would we not would we stop it, we wouldn't have <laughs> created it in the first right. place. Good point. I always use that point. It's a great point. <laughs> um, that's why I like her. So um, the anyway, I saw it and I was like, I'd love to. I'd love to just randomly turn up at these places with a guitar. Yeah. You know, it's something that I'm good at and I know people like to hear me do. And I'm like, why don't I just do that? And then something stops me and I feel like, am I, you know, with today's like permissions and, and sue yeah. lawyers and so I'm like, ah, am I going to, am I going to sing a song that's not appropriate? Am I going to, you know, even if I don't think the words are a problem, maybe somebody, some yeah. parent does or whatever. Even singing for the nurses, you know, the doctors, the, you know, the receptionist staff, like all of their attitudes trickle down to the patients. You know, if they're having a bad day, that's, you know. That's very true. That's sending yeah. them to the patient. So if you brighten their day and show them that, you know, there's some hope, you know, that transcends into the patients too. So if they won't let you into the patient rooms, you can still do it right in the lobby, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I am thinking about that. I wonder... I see. We should talk about that off off um, the podcast. I see. It'd be brilliant if we could find a way to team that up. You know, like a yeah. like an art day of some kind, and I just yeah. be singing there. Maybe go and any of the sort of more um, what's the word? More terminal patients or more unable to get out and about patients. I'd be happy to go right into yeah. the rooms and play. But of course, it's a permission thing. But I, I would love to do that. I, I would feel like I was doing something good. With my with my ability, and I, I and yeah with my ability yeah because I don't like the word gifts because um, it's not a fucking gift. I work <laughs> work damn hard to be as good as I am at singing and playing guitar, and nobody ever, nobody gave me that at all. Another point for another podcast. Um, yeah, those are two of my most hated words on earth. By the way, gifts and blessed. blessings. Yeah. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. The whole concept of that is so wrong to me. It's like. I'm so blessed. So basically what you're saying is the kid in Ethiopia is not just blessed. not like the most is not, not on, on the level. list of people that he's liking. You know, <laughs> right. I'm so blessed. And so like, well, yeah, yeah, not really. No, just because you God helped you find your car keys, you know, and you, and this other kid hasn't hit in three weeks. And, uh, yeah, yeah right. it doesn't work that way. But anyway, um, we could we could do another one. I know, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could like just, we could just keep this going for a Working while. Working in in with children and in therapy and even in CPS, you see a lot of things, and it's like, how could anyone think that this was designed? The the thing about cancer specifically is that it is a mutation of your own cells. It's not even a thing you get. 
And it's not it's something in your own body. It's Everyone's in your own body. With cancer cells. Yes, yeah. and 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 it's just like almost like it's a defect. Uh huh. And and I and any time I ever argue with anybody that's religious, I say you do realize that you believe this God of yours created all this stuff, right? But he couldn't even get fucking genetics right. Like he'll create us, but yet he we still most of us need glasses to see right. And so we couldn't get eyes right. If he did do that, then he's evil. Oh, right? If he got it right, if he got it right, he was he he programmed us to have defects so that we would slowly degenerate and die. You can use any argument, any theological argument you want for reasons we're being punished and all this nonsense, but don't you dare say that that's a reason to give a four-year-old or a two-year-old some kind of bone cancer right. where the only life they've known from birth to death at six is right. is hospital. agony and hospital and tubes up noses and nights with your family crying by your bedside. Do not tell me that in any kind of afterlife justifies that yeah. because I mean I it doesn't it doesn't matter where they go after you've still given them that that's their only goal at life was to have this miserable six years but or they were four blessed years. to live that long oh yeah sure right blessed to have make it that far you know leukemia or whatever horrible thing uh, but I mean that's even that's not even as far as like a genetic thing and what I'm, I'm talking about things like spina bifida yeah um, and even, you know, uh, Angelman syndrome and these things that I know a little bit more about, but uh, there's varying degrees of what you would say severity or whatever word you want to use. But somebody who has to have a, uh, an, uh, an air vent breathe for them. Right. Uh, it, it's like, how, if that's intentional in any way, how can you sleep at night? If a god exists, he shouldn't be able to sleep at night. He should be absolutely ashamed of himself and and if there was and if and if all this happens to be true and i end up dying and going to some place my al they, they talk about oh you, you know keith you'll have judgment day to an, to answer for your things you did i'm like no no no. when i die i'll have a fucking list ready for him yeah i'll right. be like child cancer poverty uh natural disasters yeah Just, school shootings. Well, that's my biggest thing in the world is, yeah. uh, to me, uh, I, I mentioned that on, a, on my personal podcast, but I, w- I, was, I was talking about how I was in Texas at the time, or at least in my memory, I was in Texas when Uvalde happened. Mm. And I realized I'm sitting what, uh, in a hotel about to go to the next state, wherever we were playing. And on the news is that happening, right? I mean, for many, 20 kids or something shot dead but bef- before the age of 10 or whatever it was. And I'm sitting there and I realized, holy crap, that could just have easily has been today in Plainfield. Yeah, it doesn't matter. At my yeah. my kid's school, yeah. it's just a lottery at this point. It's a lottery. Literally, your kids dying in this country is a lottery of where you happen to live and what day and what jackass right. decides to raid his granddad's arsenal in the basement. Yeah. And that is literally your kid's fate at this point. Yeah. If your kid... like. And and it's almost unbelievable to think that that is the biggest killer of kids now, bigger than anything else. Yeah. Any natural thing, any other thing, car crashes, anything, it's guns. People yeah. killing your kids with a gun. Right. And nothing's done about it. Um, I will say that, you know, Chicago, I hear this all the time, and we're getting ready to send my son to public school, and we're actually arguing about this. Neighborville, Chicago, Neighborville, Chicago, and, mm-hmm. you know... The argument that keeps getting brought up is, well, Naperville's safer. You know, like, well, is it? Because in Chicago, we have metal detectors in every single elementary school. So. Yeah, and there's that stupid myth that all Second Amendment advocates try to push, which is Chicago's the dangerous city. Right. When it's actually not on the top 20 list of dangerous cities. Right. It's such a made up thing, yeah. and I and I, I like I say on all my things that I admit, is I care about stats and truth. Yep. 
And I don't care what you feel. Like, I don't care if, oh, I feel like the world's getting worse or whatever, you know. Right. But the fact is, is that all the worst places for gun violence are all states where there's more guns and la- lesser gun laws in every one. It's, it, yeah. We're Without doing, a doubt. We're doing a, um, an immersive art experience at the gala this year. And it's going to be uh, a classroom um, setting with objects in the classroom that, are portraying um, the lack of <laughs> safety measures being taken, mm. um, and so one of you know one of the art pieces in there is um, remember those uh, wooden puzzles of the United States. I, don't, I know you didn't grow up here, but maybe your girls um, had them. Almost growing like up. wooden magnets. That They're like all the puzzle pieces are the states. Are the states? Yeah, I mean, so, we all, every country has something, something similar. like that. Yeah. So we have this puzzle, you know, and and all the states that have strict gun laws are painted one color, and all the states that don't have strict gun laws are painting another color. And then there's an actual, you know, number written on the state of how many children have passed away from gun violence, and it it is it's clear as day. Like the darker the red, the bigger the number. Yep. Yeah. So, I, it just statistics just don't lie. But but, that, but that's the know. problem is that, that that statistic will never be seen by the people who care oh. uh, the most about the Second Amendment. They Those know people. I, they don't. know the statistic. They don't care. Well, I think that the general public don't. The people who write the laws do, obviously. But the general, you know, um, you know, Joe down the street in Alabama thinks that Chicago is the worst place on earth. Yeah. They don't realize that actually your state has the most gun deaths and most kids dying, I think it's Alabama, yeah. of any state in the nation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you just have to look at the curve of any other country, right? It's like, you know, 0.001 death per 100,000 or something, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, this is like, this is a, it's like straight across mm-hmm. any country you like. America. Right. Right. <laughs> in fact, the funniest thing, and if it, well, it's hilarious, but also incredibly sad in what he's saying. Have you seen the guy on Instagram? In fact, he is somebody I would like to invite on this podcast. Yeah. Is a guy who is um guess the country and it's oh, part yeah. one, two, three, I have four. Seen that. And all he does is say he has a guess who board in front of him, the card <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the game, the board game. And um and it's like a, a, a news report and it's like today an 11 year old was shot dead by his friend um, when he knocked at his door and banged on the door too loudly right and it flicks to the guy with the guess who board and he just goes Whoosh! and knocks down all the others and it's USA Yeah, every time <laughs> every it's time. USA right. and I just think the way the guy uses comedy to make a point is right. incredible even though it's such a serious thing it's still it really serious. well done yeah we're, we're talking like I grew up in a place where I didn't have to worry about anybody having a gun yeah. ever. Like I, I wasn't worried about the old granny in the, in the store having one or the big, you know, jock guy or anybody having one. The worst you could do was get stabbed. And that would have only been, you almost could have known who that was going to be just by looking at them, mm-hmm. you know, and most of the people doing the stabbing are stabbing other people that are doing the stabbing. Right. And anybody that was shooting anybody was somebody you would either never meet or would only be shooting another guy because he's told to because of some gang or something. Mm-hmm. I never had to worry. I wasn't going to get shot. I could say that with almost 100% certainty. Mm-hmm. There's more chance of me getting into a car crash in my country 10 times in one year which is obviously highly unlikely, than getting shot. You know, we're talking millions upon hundreds of millions right. to one. There's probably more chance of me winning the lottery there than getting shot. Whereas here, there's probably, I wouldn't want to guess the statistic, right? right? Yeah. The chance of you getting you shot is probably a million times more likely than winning the lottery. Right. If the, if the, if that would be a good, like, margin to say that if in any country it's more likely to get shot that than to win the lottery, the lottery, you should probably fix the gun laws, yeah, right? You know? yeah. um, if anybody's listening to this and they want to, they're, like, inspired and they want to help you and yeah. they want to help the foundation and give you money to do what it is you do, where where and what do they do? Yeah. Um, so if anybody, you know, wants to support the arts in general, support the Art of Giving Foundation. More specifically, uh, you can go to our website, artofgivingfoundation.org. Pretty simple. 
Um, we do Zelle and Venmo. That's how we accept donations. We used to do all the complicated merchant, you know, mm. ways. And just like, this is just so silly. It's 2023. We need to get rid of all of those expensive things and yep. just use the free stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, people can donate that way. We have other uh, organizations like family. I know your wife's family's foundation always supports us. We get checks, mm. you know, people will send us checks. And then... Um, we obviously have the the gala we talked about. Uh, we do that every year, and we do monthly mixers, which are like smaller networking events um, that are always hosted at a, a new venue. Might be a restaurant or bar, might be a salon, might be a spa, you know, um, an office of some sort. So we have those every month, and then we are always out there doing community service. So always looking for volunteers. There's a volunteer application form on our website. If you're a CPS teacher, look, you know, watching this or listening to this, and you're in need of supplies, you can apply mm. on our on our website for that as well. Um, we obviously cannot service all 600 schools um, with multiple classrooms and multiple teachers, but um, we did about a thousand last year, and we're looking at about 2,500 students that will or teachers. Awesome. So yeah, we're we're getting there. We're growing. Uh, speaking, you did mention my wife, and I should mention that I'm wearing something yeah. you created. Yeah. So this is something that Autumn designed for Lynette. So just wanted to wear it for the podcast. I should have mentioned that earlier, but um, Autumn does custom designs. So it looks pretty good on me. It looks better on her, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, yeah, I really like it, and it's my kind of style, too. So I might sort of steal it. Yeah. A little bit, or get you to make, make one. one for like a custom simple one or something, or a Siberian one or something. Um, or actually, it would be cool to have something custom for this. I but. bet you we could do something custom because a lot of the ways your letters are, are a new design that I've been kind of mm-hmm. messing around with. But yeah, all of the money that we raised through those hats went to the CPS supply drive. So, oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, so it's all helping that too. Yep. Okay, cool. There are galas how often? One, twice a year? Once a year. Are Once the annual galas, yep, usually in the summertime. Okay. And uh, monthly monthly mixers. The monthly mixers. Yeah, and all of that information is on our website. So if you're looking to, you know, to attend an event first to just kind of check us out, meet all of us, meet the board, meet our other volunteers, um, come to an event, check out the website. Yeah, and I can definitely recommend it after having been to one. It was just so super cool. Band was awesome that was playing. They were great. All the artwork was fantastic. I think I you just, got up there and sang, too. Did I? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah it's uh, um, can't remember. Was that Bruno Mars or something? Like people, are, people are interested in sponsoring our events, like alcohol companies, um, our big one, food, like restaurants. Mm. Oftentimes do, like, pass bites. Like, my boyfriend works for Heaven's Door Whiskey, and they're always happy to sponsor whiskey at our events. So stuff like that, if people want to get involved, that's another way, um, you know, in-kind donations are oftentimes just as helpful as cash donations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I realized I didn't actually let you answer the question. This is something I'll get better as a podcast host. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I said, I really love your personal artwork that you do that's kind of the female form, kind of an abstract mm-hmm. thing of the female form. Tell me how, what's the inspiration, what started that, and... Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, when uh, I was younger, um, before I had my son, I would do um, like fine art type photography sessions, um, whether it be for uh, like I used to work for a company that did like wine labels in France and they wanted like different silhouettes of a woman's body as the label. So I would have to take that photo, you know, and and uh then the photographer would use that and edit it down and send it to the wine labeling company. And anyway, um, lots of examples like that, but I started to really fall in love with lighting and um, just the, the female form. But there was something um, edgy about it as well too, because oftentimes people would you know, kind of frown on me doing photo shoots like this. And I'm like, well, it's not like they're being posted online. These are very high-end photographers and projects, and they're for something very specific. But, yes, I do have to be in the room naked. And, yes, I do have to pose in weird ways to get that lighting or that angle or whatever. And, yes, sometimes my, 
you know, I'm spread eagle and sometimes, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but the photographer always tries to make me feel as comfortable as possible. Um, but I do enjoy it because I like the finished work. And I also like to see how I've been aging over the years. It's kind of interesting, you know, like, wow, that's how I looked when I was 22, you know, and that's how I look when I'm 35. And it's just, it's kind of, it's beautiful in a sense, you know. And so anyway, I, there's this edginess to, to these, you know, naked photos or these photo shoots or whatever. And um, you're so vulnerable, in that state <laughs> if you've ever had to take a naked photo shoot you know so anyway these um I started looking through these photos and realizing that I could see a lot of uh, emotion uh you could almost tell when I was the most uncomfortable you know um and I kind of you know equated that to some of the times in my life like when I've been the most vulnerable has been when I'm actually allowing myself to express my emotions um, fully without feeling like I'm being judged. And one of the places I do that typically is in the shower. So I'll, you know, just kind of let it out, let it get a good cry in, you know, and you're just so vulnerable. You're standing there sobbing and you're naked. You have no makeup on. You look like a wet rat, you know, and you're just like, if somebody were to walk in right now, I look pretty sad, you know, um, and so I painted this piece of, of me from a from a photo I, I had done where I was in a shower, kind of pushed up against the glass, my hand on the shower, and I painted this piece. But once I got to the face, it was like I remember being so sad at that time in my life when I took that photo. And so I just painted her as a, having a skull face, you know, and just mm -hmm. kind of like feeling dead inside. It's like here's this beautiful, like, you know, naked woman, like up against the, up against the glass, you would think she's, you know, has everything going for her, but really deep inside, she's very unhappy, you know, and she's, I think that probably know, resonates with a lot of women. A lot. And it has to do with self-image, which is, you know, at the time I was, I was dealing with self-image issues. Like, you know, I'm getting older and things are changing and, you know, I'm struggling with all sorts of little things and, it was just a lot that day and I was in the shower and that's when you see yourself naked, right? When you're getting into the shower and the lighting's always like crap. So, you know, you see every dimple and every, mm -hmm. you know, imperfection. And, um, I was just being really hard on myself that day and I was, you know, I was letting it all out. So it started with that and now it's just kind of developed into this, you know, some of them are, are solemn. Some of them are happy. So it just kind of depends on, on what I'm doing, but the series is called in my shower and it's kind of like the emotions and thoughts that are kind of going through my head when I'm You have that particular there. picture, the one you're talking about handy, right? Like you have a, I have an image of it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll probably put yeah. that up. Yeah, We are two examples of people that have made the creative arts they're living. Yeah. And that's pretty rare. And people have this weird thing where they see in my profession, at least, at Justin Timberlake, and they think that's when you've made it. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> right. no, no. Uh, you know, if that was if you'd made it, it would be a you know one in a hundred million. Right. That actually make it. I mean, I'm making a good living and and have a beautiful family and house and life, all from being good at what, at, at what I love. Yeah. And that's something that anybody can do if they are willing to put in the time and dedication that whole 10,000 hours thing that people talk about you yeah. know where they you put in the time which is why I hate the word gifted because right yes you might I mean, have you some genetic talented. talent yeah. but you have to harness that and be willing to put in the work as well or else it's You'll lose it. it yeah and the hard work that comes behind the scenes too yeah. you know oh anyway, yeah yeah thank the, you. awesome the amount of work behind all this is yeah, tremendous. People don't I mean, see look what it. you're doing now. Like it's it's just an extension of everything you're doing. You yeah. know, it's more work and and dedication to something. So yeah, people see me on the stage for two hours, and that's that's the Keith they think is yeah. the real Keith, and they don't realize that there's literally the whole other um, however many hours in the week before yeah. I arrive at the show that's right. gone into making that happen oh it's the same thing with art shows yeah, of course like oh wow that's a beautiful piece of art like how long did that take you i'm like 96 hours yeah, yeah. And they're like yeah. what <laughs> I'm like, yeah it took me months yeah <laughs> for this one show yeah please buy it <laughs> exactly please buy it. yeah the, if it was if it was just a case of how many hours you put into something as well people would just be blown away by you know like and people are like Oh, it's a good thing we love to do what we do yeah i know they're like how did you learn all those medleys i'm like i put those medleys together 
and learned them over and over again till it became muscle memory. Right. That took two months of learning. Right. To get it where I can perform it for you guys. It's not like I just put it together and started singing it or playing it or whatever. Right. It's the right. same for you. You know that I, I, and the funny thing is, is most people wouldn't even know where, where you, where we begin in our process either. Mm-hmm. Like for you, it's like, I think like you, you get some kind of, you have a canvas, right? Yeah. And you're like, I, I would be like, well, do you start with like a base layer? Do you, does, does, you know, does one particular yeah, color gets done first and all this kind of stuff? You see what I mean? Like, no really, it, it actually has to come from uh, inspiration. Like, even when I'm commissioned to do something, I'll buy all the canvases, buy all the, like the paint. I know the concept and colors and everything that the client wants, but it will sit there sometimes for a month because I'm like, I don't know what I want to do yet. Like, mm-hmm. I have, and it always comes to me. Like, as I'm going to bed or right as I wake up, I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. And then I go and get started. But it might just sit there for a little while until I have inspiration. Right. You know? Right. Well, as long as you've always got a bottle of red handy <laughs> and some good music, you can get <laughs> yeah. up at four in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I should really do that more because I get so many great ideas. In the morning, I'm like, yeah, 4.35 o'clock, I'm up every morning. I force myself yeah, to go I love to my sleep. sleep too much is the thing. I'll go back to sleep knowing I'll wake up and forget this great idea I had. But my, but I, I'll be willing to do it because I'll get another like three hours of good sleep. You yep. know, but, I know. Yeah. Same, same. I was just saying that today on the way over here. I was like, I have got to start doing something with these hours I have in the morning because I really am not sleeping sleeping uh, it's right. like restless sleep you know so mm-hmm. i might as well and i do i wake up with these crazy good ideas and then you know just like a dream if you don't write it down it's gone and yeah, yeah so i got it i gotta start doing something with my hours that, that was the one good thing because i don't like to say anything good about the whole covid thing but the one good thing that happened through that was that i learned to be productive more yeah like now when something needs done it just gets done i just go do it yeah. You know, like I'll I'll be editing this down and making it, you know, ready with the audio and stuff. I'll just do it versus going, I'll do that in a couple of days. I've got something else I'm going to do. I'm going to fart about and do this and that. It just gets done. Yeah. And I've noticed that I'm. it makes me feel way more. Um, oh, and it also allows me to relax. Right. So like I'll, I read a lot, as you know, and I'll, I'll like feel guilty as I'm sitting there reading an hour's worth of, of book because I'll be like, I could have been doing something else. But if I've done all this work right. already, I sit back and I feel good inside and <laughs> I enjoy the book and I'm right there in the book reading it going, oh my God, oh my God, you know, I'm so excited about what I'm reading. And then I put it down and back to work again and it hasn't been like in the back of my head, you still need to send that contract. Right. You still need to learn that song. I'm a little bit opposite of that. If I don't read in the morning before getting started, I'm jumbled. Oh, really? So I need to read and like decompress. It's almost like meditative for me. Uh. So that I'm like, okay, now I can, I can put things in the order in which they need to get done. Whereas if I just hop to things right away in the morning... It's a little ADHD going on. It's a little scattered. So that's funny though, because that's a first world creative problem that we have, yeah. which is how to to uh, plan our timing of our day. Most people don't have that because they're working a job they don't right. like. Right. They're getting up at seven because their work starts at eight. Right. And if they're not there, they get fired. Right. Whereas I'm we technically create tasks. <laughs> yeah, we have we have tasks that we know need done. Like yeah. I, like I said yesterday, I was out working in the garage getting new cabling done for the new guitar player. All these things, you know, that need to be right. done that I know I could procrastinate on, but I'm just like, no, I just go do them. Right. Right. And I feel so great after I've done it. Gonna go out and sit in the sun and bake and read a book, <laughs> right. and and that that's what makes me happy, you know. Right. So I can do the things that make me happy because I'm getting the work done. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's that's something that I've always admired about you because I've seen it firsthand. It's just how you structure your day and how you, you know, when we've been working together on things, it's like you just you, you work hard so you can play hard, mm-hmm. and that's a great way to be. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's it's fulfilling. You know, if you play too much, you feel empty inside. If you work too hard, you feel empty inside. Yeah, <laughs> balance. balance. Life is all about balance. I agree. Yeah. But I tell you what, if I did win the lottery, like if I won like 100 mil, yeah, I wouldn't work ever again. No, me neither. No, I mean work, work. I mean, I would do this still. Right. I would play you tennis play. still and I would play music still. Right. But it wouldn't. I wouldn't need the money from it. I'd still do it. 
Right. And that's how you know you're in the right profession. Yeah. But I wouldn't do the contracts anymore or any of that stuff. Right. Um, the, <laughs> I, I would still paint. I would still take commissions, though. I love painting. Oh, yeah. I would still do it. But somebody else would handle the contracts. Yeah. And somebody else would handle the installations and the all that stuff. Yeah. And and Art of Giving would be doing a lot better. <laughs> We'd be doing a lot. <laughs> I would really love know. to get off social media, too. But that's just part of what I have to do. I know. And I, I, know, I, I don't know. like it. I think it's a terrible it's thing. Work. And I, I, I'm reading all the... the um, what do they call it? The stuff into how bad it is for kids. Yeah. And we all luckily didn't have to deal with that as we when we were kids. I mean, we, we had Mario Brothers. <laughs> yeah, I was a mean Mario Kart player, to be fair. But, yeah. but I mean, that was... It was... Um, there were, was no social media. There were, that, no. I mean, pretty much MySpace was our first ex- example of that. And that yeah. was... By the time you'd created your page, you were done. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Once you figured yeah. out how to create your page, you were more proud of how it looked. You didn't really want to go on anymore and interact with anyone. Right. <laughs> you were right. so tired. <laughs> oh my and god, I got it to turn like, pink or whatever. Yeah, you know? right. That's like this number on this code, or at least that might have been me. But I think we'll have to split this into like a, a bonus thing because yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll feature all the things that are what we came to talk about, and then we'll maybe do an after yeah. hours thing type thing. We'll talk about all the. The, I think the it's great, events. though, to show that, you know, because I think a lot of people look at, they think I'm like a saint sometimes, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm an atheist. And uh, uh, yeah, Like, well, to me, that would be a saint. Right. It would be somebody right. that's thought it through and decided the right. right thing, which is to do the right thing for no reward no or reward no punishment. Right. <laughs> it's to do it, you know. Purely it's the, because it's the right, the right thing, thing to, to do. do. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. would always pick somebody that's doing it for altruistic reasons than for reward or, or punishment right. because it's a belief to just ritual trend you know it's a yeah you believe tradition. something is good because somebody else said it was versus just it feel it like this is, should right. be what we should do right it, that's you know brilliant i like that it's a good note to end on okay. yeah. i just want to say thank you very much to autumn for coming in today and uh, i hope you like the little podcast set up and maybe uh, we'll outside <laughs> I know, I know. I'm very proud of it. it's good. well thanks anyway. for having me I enjoyed you know telling my story and hopefully it inspires more artists to you know come out and and get creating